Okay, well, this morning, we are continuing Paul's argument against the Judaizers to try to confirm the Galatians in the true gospel, which is that we are justified by God's grace, which, is, which means a free gift of His grace, free gift from Him, uh, through faith alone, which excludes all works, and that, in this case, the works of the ceremonial law, circumcision, and the ceremonies, and and all of those things, and it would exclude the moral law as well. We're not saved by keeping the moral law. But the moral law does remain, of course, as our standard of how we are to live. But let's um, look at the next segment of his argument in Galatians 4, verses 1 through 7. Paul writes this, Now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, Although he is owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the Father. So also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you were sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Well, may the Lord bless this portion of his word to our understanding and our growth in grace. Well, remember last time uh, we were considering the question, I should say Paul was considering the question, if God's covenants are permanent, remember he said once they're ratified, they remain in force, if the Abrahamic covenant remains in force along with its promise of justification by grace through faith alone, which is the way that Abraham was justified, then what was the purpose of the Mosaic covenant? Well, Paul answered, it was not given to be a new way of salvation, okay? The law had been given, which was able to justify us or save us, then salvation would have come through the law. But it doesn't come through the law, it comes through faith, which means it was never given for that purpose. So why was it given? It was given as a teacher, uh, to teach us our need, okay, of the promise given in the Abrahamic covenant. Remember the, the moral law? shows us our sins. We're guilty. We need a Savior. The sacrifices shows us the penalty God requires for sin. The wages of sin is death, as well as the possibility of substitution. Okay, and we need to be thankful for that because they were pointing to Christ. And the mediators, the Moses and the priests, were there to remind us that we were alienated from God and that we needed someone who could stand between us and reconcile us. Now again, all these things were meant to drive us to the promise God gave to Abraham. Remember that through his descendant, all the nations of the earth would be blessed so that we would trust in him and we would receive the blessings of justification, adoption, and the inheritance. Okay, he's the one who offers the sacrifice that takes away our sins. He is our priest who makes the sacrifice. He is our mediator between us and God who actually reconciles us to God. And Paul's point also was this, that now that Jesus has come, the descendant of Abraham, we no longer need the teacher. The old covenant has fulfilled its purpose and was about to pass away. Remember in Paul's day, that hadn't happened yet. 70 AD was yet future, which means all those things were ongoing. But the author to the Hebrews reminds us that they have been fulfilled in Christ. Something better has come. And these things, these shadows are about to pass away. Now, remember, uh, this has raised a bit of an issue, uh, and I just want to address it again briefly in case you happen to run into somebody who might argue with you about this. But if it's true that every covenant, once it's ratified and put, in, you know, put into force, once it's active, can never be abrogated, can't be nullified, can't be set aside, conditions can't be added to it, well then there are those who are going to argue that the Mosaic Covenant is still in force because it's a covenant made by God and it was ratified 
right? So if they're all binding, if they're all permanent, then how can we say that we don't have to keep the Mosaic Covenant? Well, there are those who would say that in our camp, okay? Uh, Greg Bonson was one of those people. But they would also be quick to add that, yes, sacrifice is still required, but the sacrifice that we bring is the sacrifice of Christ. And mediation is still needed, but the mediator that we look to is, of course, the mediation of Christ. And when you look at it that way, it really amounts to the same thing, okay? The Old Covenant system, the Mosaic Covenant, is still teaching us our need of these things, but Christ has fulfilled them, and we go to Him for the things that that covenant tells us that we need. Well, Paul moves on now to use another analogy to teach the Galatians, to teach us, because remember, we're, we're, we're no different than the Galatians. We, were gen, we're, we are Gentiles, so we were Gentiles, I should say, uh, and we were bound under a false religion as the Galatians were before we came to Christ. And we uh, could very well be in the same situation, and maybe we've even thought about it. Uh, being Christians, maybe you pick up your Bible, you look at the, the Jewish traditions, and you wonder, do I need to keep these ceremonies? Do I need to keep these rites and so forth? Well, this applies to us as much as it applies to them. And it is the answer to all those questions and that relationship between the Old Covenant, the Mosaic Covenant, and the New Covenant. So next, Paul is using an analogy to teach us why God gave the Mosaic Covenant and why it's no longer needed or necessary that we keep those things. And the argument he uses is that of heirs that are underage who have now reached maturity. And the question that he's asking us this morning is this, that if we have grown up and we have inherited what it is that, uh, that was promised to us as heirs, should we again place ourselves under the guardians that we had as children? And of course, the answer is no. Now, first of all, Paul reminds us of our situation prior to Christ's coming in verses 1 through 3. And this applies to us in a certain sense, even as Gentiles, even as it applies to... Uh, the Jews, it, there's, and we're going to look at see how it applies to Gentiles as well. But Paul says this, Now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the Father. So also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. Now, what Paul is saying here is that when, when heirs, you know, heirs of, of an inheritance, maybe of a king or perhaps a family inheritance, it could be any type of inheritance, when they're children, their situation is very much like that of a slave in that they must obey their governing authorities, their guardians their managers. But the only difference really, he says, when, when a, an heir is a, is a child, the only difference between them and a slave is that slaves are not heirs, okay? They don't inherit anything, while heirs eventually inherit everything. But while they're children, while the heirs are children, there's really not much of a difference. They're both enslaved, okay? I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about uh, maybe an application or perhaps an illustration of this would be Prince Charles. How many years, you know, did Prince Charles have to wait, you know, while he kept the rules in order to conform? And again, nobody's perfect, right? Before he finally became king, before he finally, you know, inherited what was his, and he eventually did. And then the rules change, okay? Well, in the same way, when the Jews were heirs under age, under the Mosaic Covenant, Paul is saying they were like slaves. They were bound to obey the ceremonial law. Uh, and remember, it was bondage. It, it was gracious that God gave it to them, but it was a tremendous amount of, of work that was involved in the sacrifices, the cleansing rituals, the feasts, all of these things pointing to the spiritual blessings ahead, but still all of them a burden. As Peter said, a yoke which neither our fathers nor we 
have been able to bear. They were enslaved to them. Now, Paul calls them, these rites and ceremonies and rituals, the elemental things of the world. And that's a phrase that commentators have a difficult time understanding. Perhaps you have as you've read the Bible. What does that mean? Well, one commentator explains it in this way. The Greek phrase in contemporary literature outside the New Testament refers to the basic elements that make up the world, earth, wind, water, and fire, according to ancient thought. Here, Paul is probably applying this concept to the law and especially its elaborate and outward ceremonies and ordinances as suited to God's people in the old age. Relative to the freedom to come, life under the Mosaic law was a kind of bondage. I think what Paul is saying here is this, that the temple, the ceremonial system, all this, these rites and rituals they were going through were all tied to this world. And as long as God's people were under that system, they were bound like slaves to do what it required. And it was a form of, of bondage. And yet, those who were going through all this work were heirs. Now, the Galatians were under a similar bondage. Okay? Notice what Paul writes in verse 3. So also we, while we were children. Now, remember that Paul is writing to the Galatians, and the Galatians never really were under that system. And the only reason why he's, he's warning them of it now is because the Judaizers are trying to get them under that system. But he's saying when we, in the past, we were also in a very similar situation. Again, the commentator writes this, Paul uses the same term to refer to the idolatrous practices in the Galatians' pagan past. So they were also slaves to a false religion. By the way, let's not forget, we were too. Even if we were raised in a Christian household, because we, we didn't understand, unless we happened to be you know, regenerated, converted at a very early age, and that's pretty rare. Even if we were raised in a Christian household, for us, it was still a false religion in the sense that we were, if we were doing anything, we were trying to conform to that image. We were trying to be good enough in order to be a Christian uh, because we likely did not understand salvation by grace through faith alone. But if we weren't in a Christian household, how much more? Because we were walking around in absolute darkness, you know, without God's light. We didn't have the Bible, most of us, except for general revelation. You know, what God shows us of himself in nature, what we've been looking at in apologetics, and, of course, what he tells us in our conscience that leaves us without excuse for our unbelief and our sin. But let me ask you, if you can remember what it was like to be in that situation, did you ever find yourself trying to work or to improve your life or to become better so that God might accept you? Well, I did, and I, maybe I thought I achieved it, you know, but not realizing that I failed because, again, the Spirit of God wasn't yet working in me in that way. Now, Paul is saying what the Jews were under, the ceremonial system, was the same thing. He's implying it's the same thing that the Galatians were under, right? There's a connection between these two things, the Galatians' paganism and the Judaizers' misuse of the Mosaic Covenant and the Jews' misuse of that covenant. Because remember, they looked at it as a covenant of works. Now, that is the connection. Under both systems, the Jews and the Galatians were attempting to justify themselves through their works. And so both of them were under a curse. That was the case with us. We were under the curse because we were trying to justify ourselves before God. But Paul's point is this. God changed all of that in Christ. Verses 4 and 5, but when the fullness of the time came... God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that He might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Now, let's unpack this a little bit to understand what, what's going on here. 
Paul says when it was time. Notice God has a sovereign timetable in his plan. When it was his time. Remember when Jesus began his ministry? The first thing he says, at least as Mark records it, is the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Okay? There was a timetable, a prophetic timetable, and we, we saw that with the 70 weeks of Daniel, remember, how Jesus comes after the fulfillment of the 69th week. Jesus appears and he begins his ministry. But when, now, this is before that, of course, because this is where he sends him into the world. When it was time, God sent forth his son. Now, the second thing I want us to notice is this. Jesus is called the son before he's sent into the world. God sends his son into the world. Jesus did not become the son of God through his supernatural conception and birth. There are those who believe that really the term son only applies to his human nature and not his divine nature. Paul says that Jesus was already the son of God when God sent him. He is the begotten of the father from all eternity. That's why we you know, believe that you know, God tells us the only distinctions he really gives to us between the three persons of the Godhead is contained in their names, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, of course, in the work of redemption, they all take different roles, willingly, of course. But those are how they distinguish themselves. And Son is something that has distinguished the Son of God from all eternity. So he sent forth his Son, born of a woman. God sent him into the world through the incarnation. Now, here's something to kind of think about. Uh, the Son of God did not actually leave heaven in order to come into this world. I know that's kind of a little bit of a mind bender, but the Bible says he descended, okay? Who, is it the, who ascended except he who first descended? But the way that he descended was by joining himself to our nature by being conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary. His descent was not he left heaven and came down, but rather he joined himself to this human nature and became the person in that human nature. With regard to his divine nature, we know that Christ or the Son of God is still everywhere. But as to his human nature, he can only be in one place at one time. Now, being born of a woman also means to be born of her substance, to come from her, to come from her stuff, so to speak. Jesus needed to become part of our race. He had to become one with us in order to redeem us, in order to make the payment on our behalf. And so the Spirit supernaturally created His human nature in Mary's womb using her substance in order that he might be one of us so that he might make the payment on our behalf. And then notice Paul says he was born under the law. The Son of God voluntarily became one with us so that he might take the obligation to obey that law for us upon himself and fulfill its requirements for us. And that's what we mean. That's what Charles Wesley meant when he says Jesus is our surety. Uh, our guarantee of receiving the blessings of the covenant stands before the Father in heaven, and he pleads his sacrifice on our behalf. So he was born under the law, that he might redeem those who were under the law, that he might provide for us that perfect righteousness and cancel out our debt uh, through the cross by paying what God's justice required through his own sacrifice, so that, Paul says in verse 5, we might receive the adoption as sons. And again, let's not be thrown off by this because I know the, the, the you know, male terms are used often, but it's used generically that we might become his sons and daughters by adoption through faith, something that you and I could never possibly gain through our own obedience because through our own obedience, we're under the curse and all we deserve for our mountain of, as Paul said of his own works, our mountain of dung is damnation. Okay, we never could have received the blessing, but we receive the adoption of sons through what Jesus Christ has done because he has done all things well. Now, 
being adopted in Christ, Paul says, we have three blessings. The first is we're no longer slaves, but sons. We've, we've moved from our minority, we've moved from our childhood to our maturity, to our adulthood. In Christ, Jews are no longer enslaved to the elemental things of the world. They no longer have to keep up the types and the shadows, the ceremonial, the sacrificial laws. These guardians, these managers, these teachers, they no longer need them. They were meant to point them to their need of Christ, and now Christ has come, and if you've received Christ, you don't need the teacher. And the same thing is true of us as Gentiles, is that we don't need that teacher. We didn't have that teacher, but we, we came to Christ, but now the Judaizers are telling us we need to put ourselves under those managers, under those teachers. No, Paul says that's already, it's already served its purpose. Christ has already come. We do, not, we do not need them. We are accepted in Christ because of His righteousness. And the Lord has taken away the heavy yoke that was on us, even though we were not keeping up the ceremonial system as Gentiles before we came to faith in Christ. We did have a very heavy yoke on our shoulders, and that was trying to get God to accept us because of who we are. You know, that's something that was very heavy and we could never lift it off on our, you know, by ourselves. But the Lord has taken it and He's replaced it with a lighter yoke. Remember how Jesus said His yoke is easy, His burden is light? Well, the reason why it's so light is because He's changed our hearts so that we want to do now what He, what he commands us to do. You ever thought about as a child and maybe sometimes as an adult, you know, trying to keep the requirements that your parents put on you or that the Lord puts on us as Christians, you know? I mean, what is so difficult about the Ten Commandments? What, what is it that makes it hard? Is it those things are impossible to do? Or is it because we don't want to do them? <laughs> you see, that, that is the real problem, isn't it? It's the want to, the desire level. Well, the way that Jesus makes our yoke lighter is by changing our disposition towards those commandments so that we want to do them. You know, He gives us His Spirit to fulfill the law in us so that we, we do love God and we want to do what the commandments require and we, we love our neighbor and we want to do what is good towards them. Now, imperfectly, again, especially when it comes to our neighbor because they're not so lovely, but God is. Okay. But the point is this, it's not hard to obey when that is what you want to do. You know, you ask a child, uh, do you want to clean up your room? Well, not necessarily, and, and it's like pulling teeth to get them to do it sometimes. Would you like an ice cream? Well, yes, I love ice cream. You know, I love to have that. Well, it's, what's the difference? You know, well, ice cream is enjoyable. <laughs> Cleaning your room isn't. Well, the thing is, there shouldn't be anything unenjoyable about the law of God, but the problem is our heart. Remember how Paul says in Romans chapter 7, there's nothing wrong with the law. It's my heart. That's the problem. But when that heart is changed, it makes it easier. So the yoke has become a lot lighter. So that's one of the, um, the blessings that we have now is that we have an easier yoke to bear. And now that we're God's children, we also have a greater blessing. And that is, we have the greatest blessing that God has to give us, to be called His children, to be owned by Him, to be loved by Him. Do you know that if you have that, if you have that adoption through faith in Christ, you have the greatest blessing you could possibly have. It would be better to have that and to suffer hardship in this world and to be ridiculed and hated and even to be put into prison, uh, to be beaten, to be shipwrecked, if I can, you know, I could add all the things that Paul went through, okay? It would be better to be God's child and go through that than to be the most popular person in the world, to have all the riches of the world, to have all the pleasures and comforts of the world, and not have that adoption because of what's going to happen in the end. Remember, Jonathan Edwards reminds us, doesn't really matter who prospers down below. That's just a brief period of time. The Bible calls it just 
you know, vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. What really matters is who is going to prosper in the eternal state. Those who prosper in the eternal state are those who believe in Christ or adopted by God and who follow Him. Even if it's going to be hard for this brief period of time, it's going to be glorious in the future that is to come, and we'll, we'll see a little bit more about that in a second. So the first, again, the first blessing is we're no longer slaves, but we are sons. The second blessing is the spirit of adoption. Verse 6, because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now, Paul is not saying here that once we trust in Christ, then He gives us His Spirit. That's not what he means here, because we know God had to give us His Spirit to make us alive before we would ever trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what Jesus says in John 6, 63, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. We come into this world in the flesh, unable to please God, unable to submit to Him. We hate Him. We hate His commandments. We're not going to do it. That's why those who are in the flesh cannot please God. The flesh profits nothing, but it is the Spirit who gives life. So He gives us the Spirit in order that we might trust. So what's He talking about here? Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of the Son into our hearts. What He means is, having come to Christ by His Holy Spirit, the Spirit then comes and gives to us this confidence to call God our Father. That's how He becomes the Spirit of adoption. And by the way, there's not like a, a huge time lapse between those things. It's not like, you know, He sends the Spirit, makes you alive. Somewhere down the road, you trust in Christ. After you trust in Christ, somewhere down the road, then He gives you the Spirit of adoption. These things happen instantly. They follow right on each other. And there's really no time lapse. There may be a time lapse in our, our realizing that these things have happened. But, but they are there right away. They follow on one another. And this is, as I've said, that confidence that the Spirit gives us to call God our Father, to say it, and to know that it's true. Now, what's the advantage of that? It strengthens our assurance that, that we belong to Him. Remember, the greatest blessing is, is to be a child of God, but the second greatest blessing is to know that you're a child of God because you can be a child of God and not know it. You know, many Christians have struggled with their assurance uh, for many years. You can be saved and not have a full assurance. You'll have some assurance, but you can still have doubts. And we've all wrestled with doubts. But the Spirit is given to us to try to resolve or, or to resolve some of those, those doubts and questions by giving to us that confidence. Now, having that confidence, that brings again other blessings, doesn't it? Um, the comfort of knowing that as His children, we will not be lost. If we belong to God, we belong to Him forever, don't we? So we will not be lost. And if we belong to God, it also means that we know that when we come to Him and ask Him for whatever we need, that He will provide it for us. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, if you then being evil, that is human parents, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask Him? Jesus says we can ask the Father for whatever we need in His name, and the Father will give it to us, including, again, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So it is a tremendous blessing to be adopted and to know that we're adopted. And finally, being an adopted child of God means that we are heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. He says in verse 7, therefore you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. So we no longer have to, to try and work to be good enough in order to receive the inheritance. Through faith, we inherit the kingdom with Christ. And what that means is, like Paul, we can have that confidence that when we die, we will depart to be with Him. And Paul <laughs> tells us that that is very much better than anything that we have ever experienced here. Now, again, it's not the streets of gold and it's not the, you know, the layers of precious stones and things like that that makes heaven to be heaven. 
what it really is, is, is the, the quality of life that we will experience there, which is a, well, how would you put it? We're, you know, the, the Puritans put it this way, that, that we are basically plunged into a world of perfect love and joy and peace that eradicates everything contrary to that. We're just filled to the full of joy and blessedness and love. And of course, there's no sickness, there's no death, there's nothing but a perfect sense of well-being. I mean, think about the best day you've ever experienced in this life, the happiest day you've ever had. And all the joy, you're just bursting with, with pleasure over that, and hopefully it was a good thing and not a bad thing. But whatever it was, is nothing compared to what you're going to feel and experience in heaven, uh, again, just being filled with the Holy Spirit uh, perfectly and having all sin removed. But of course, there's something even greater than that experience, and that is who's there, right? And it's not the perfected saints, and it's not the angels, although they're going to be interesting, I suppose, to interact with and, and to see, but the three persons of the Godhead are there in their limitless beauty, the beauty of holiness, which is perfect love. And their hearts are going to be beaming with infinite love towards us, God, our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, His Son, and the Holy Spirit. Heaven is heaven to the believer because of their presence. And by the way, that's also the reason why believers want to meet together on the Lord's Day to worship is because the Lord is present here as well, and this is as close as we get to heaven while we are on our way. You know, we just read in that meditation earlier about how the Father and the Son come to us, and we've read how He gives us the Spirit, and so in a certain sense, all three of them are dwelling within our hearts, and as we gather together to worship, the Lord is present with us to bless. So what we desire in this is going to be, you know, elevated to the nth degree in heaven. And of course, things only get better once Jesus returns and makes all things new again. When He's going to raise our dead bodies again to life, we're going to have resurrected and glorified bodies that are going to be perfectly suited to enjoy the new creation that the Lord is going to make where we get to live in His presence forever. Now, the question all of this is pointing to is this. Paul's asking us, would you rather have that? <laughs> would you rather have these blessings of adoption? By trusting in Christ, they are yours if you've trusted in Him. Or would you rather go back to, to slavery? You know, under the Judaizers' counsel to put yourselves under the ceremonial law, or any system of works by which you try to earn God's favor. You see, if you do that, again, Paul's going to have stronger words for that. That's to fall from grace. That's to be cut off from Christ. That is to make everything that Jesus did of no effect. You lose everything. That's what every system of works has to offer. All it can do is put us under the curse. It cannot give us the blessings. They, those come only by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you prefer God's blessings of adoption, then trust Jesus Christ. Keep trusting Him alone and leave your good works out of the equation. Okay, when it comes to justification, they have no place. Your works, my works have no place in justification. It's only the works of Christ. Sanctification is a different matter we've already seen but we need to make sure we guard this very carefully. All right, well, let's um, bow in a moment of prayer. Let's ask the Lord to um, help us search our hearts to make sure that, again, by His grace, we are trusting Jesus alone. Our hope is based upon Him alone, and we're going to need that as we would progress into the sanctification area. That's, you know, those things can often be challenging and can shake us. We need to make sure that we are trusting in Jesus Christ.